Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Sailor Academy's MBA 602 Marketing Management. This is our review of Unit 4, and uh, I just want to welcome everyone back who's been joining us before. A slight difference to uh, what happens as usual. We are recording this uh, a little ahead of time, so we will not be able to respond to your questions live in chat but we will absolutely get to your questions uh, later. So if you have any questions as we're going throughout this, feel free to leave them in the comment, sen check the comment section below, and we'll get to them uh, either down there or uh, in, in a later video. But um, for right now, uh, I'll hand it uh, over to, uh, to Dr. Salzer to just uh, get us going. Okay, thank you, Mike. All right, so here we are at unit four. And in unit four, we will be covering consumer organizational and service marketing. So there are three learning objectives for, for this unit. And the first one is we will describe the characteristics of consumer marketing and buyer behavior. We'll talk about um, organizational markets and buying procedures. And we're going to look specifically at how organizational, the organizational buying process varies uh, from the consumer buying process. And we'll also look at the distinctive characteristics of marketing services, which, which varies uh, significantly from marketing tangible products. So let's get right into it. Uh, again, I, and I've mentioned this in other, in other uh, reviews, why are the learning objectives important? First of all, they, they really set up the foundation of, of the material that would be, that's being covered it ties back to the course material and the content within that particular unit. It's important to recognize that the assessments are tied to each learning objective. So as we go through the learning objectives to really pay close attention because the assessments are tied to those objectives and it will also help you when you get ready to, to start studying and preparing for, for your exams. So if, again, uh, this is being recorded. So if you have any questions, please make sure you put them in the comment section and we will get them, we will get back to you uh, as soon as we can. So the topics that we will be exploring today are specifically purchase decisions. We'll talk about different types of purchases. We'll look at the buying decision process uh, for consumers as well as uh, in business to business markets. Uh, we'll look at buying behavior. Uh, as I mentioned before, we'll talk about characteristics of services, uh, referrals, as well as building customer relationships. So the first learning objective that we're going to explore today is to describe the characteristics of consumer marketing and buying behavior. And uh, specifically, we'll look at the differences between high involvement purchase decisions and low involvement purchase decisions. We're going to look at the stages in the consumer buying process, which um, you should note are the same whether or not we are purchasing, we are making a high involvement or low involvement purchase decision. And we'll also look at the factors that might impact the consumer decision-making process. So let's first look at high involvement and low involvement purchase decisions. And uh, in this situation, um, low involvement uh, decision making are, are things that are more um, habitual decision, uh, purchase decisions that we make. Uh, they could be impulse purchases, and they're basically um, purchases that we make without really giving too much thought to what we're going to do. Um, generally, those purchases have low risk associated with them, as well as um, having a, a lower price. When it comes to a high involvement purchase decision, for example, uh, we, spend, we tend to spend more time gathering information. The risk of making a, a poor choice is generally uh, higher, and generally the price uh, of what we're buying is higher as well. So the example here, uh, for habitual and low involvement is something like soda, uh, soft drinks, if, depending upon where you are and, and, and the wording that you use for those things, limited problem solving kind of in the middle, which I might refer, refer to clothing. And again, extended problem solving might be to a car. Uh, if you're someone that does not purchase a car too often and, and recognizing that, that the risk of making a, a bad decision is kind of high because it's a, it's a 
uh, an expensive uh, purchase. So let's look at the consumer uh, buying process. And it's important to recognize that uh, no matter what we buy, whether it's a simple low involvement decision-making process or whether it's a, a high involvement complex decision-making process, that the process is the same no matter what we buy. The amount of time we spend on that process might vary, but the process is always the same. So if we use an example, let's say um, it's morning and um, you decide that it's time for, for buying your, your morning cup of coffee. You have that need recognition for coffee. Uh, you might spend very little time on making an information, on doing an information search because you might have your regular favorite coffee shop that you, that you make your purchase from. So you might not give it really much thought. You might not give any thought to any other alternatives. Uh, your purchase decision might be made pretty quickly. And if it's a place that you go to often, your post-purchase behavior is likely to be the same each time. Unless of course you buy your typical cup of coffee and that particular day the coffee is no good. So the process might be very quick because it's something that you buy all the time. But let's, let's say uh, now you decide that you find that you need a new computer. The process of buying a new computer is going to take a lot more time than it took you to make the purchase decision for that cup of coffee. If you're buying a new computer, you're probably going to do a fair amount of, of search for information, uh, what's available, what kind of um, features does it, does it have, how much does it cost, uh, perhaps the timing uh, might be a factor as well. Uh, so you're going to do a lot of information, spend a lot of time gathering that information and then once you have that information, take probably a considerable amount of time um, evaluating the information that you have and the choices that are presented to you. Once you're done with that process, which again could take quite a bit of time, you're going to make your purchase decision, um, buy that new computer. And then once you have it, decide whether or not you're happy with that. So again, the, the process is the same whether or not you're making an expensive purchase or a, or a habitual purchase, um, and the amount of time that you spend on it will really um, vary from purchase to purchase. So let's talk about some of the factors that impact the, um, the purchase decision process. And these will all impact our, our behavior. So uh, things like the situations that we find ourselves in can have an impact on, on our decision-making process. Sometimes the store environment uh, can be a factor. Think about stores that you've gone into where you feel that the store environment really feels wonderful uh, and, and it kind of um, makes you wanna spend more time there. And as a result, you probably end up buying something as compared to going into a store where you'll go in and, and the environment isn't nice, the store is maybe run down, uh, you know, merchandise looks dirty or dusty, those things can impact whether or not you're gonna make a decision uh, in that store or make that purchase decision. The time of day can impact uh, your decision-making process. Perhaps uh, at the end of the day, let's say if you go into a supermarket and you haven't had lunch maybe, uh, you might be buying more than you would, ha would have if you had gone in earlier in the day when you were fresh, you'd already had breakfast or something like that. Um, the weather can make us uh, feel a certain way about the purchase decisions that we make, as well as the kinds of things that we might be, that we might be buying. Um, social factors. Uh, so let's, let's tie this together specifically with um, one of the bullet points a little bit further down that talks about friends and family. So the social factors and friends and family um, relate to our reference groups the people with whom we associate, the people that we spend time with every day, our family, our friends, even coworkers, these are our reference groups, the people that we, that we interact with on a regular basis. And we have a tendency to uh, gather information from those people because we trust them, we know them, we spend a lot of time with them. And so those, the, the kinds of things that those, the people that we associate with buy can impact the kinds of things that we buy as well. Um, the groups with, with, with whom we associate, 
the lifestyles that we have, all of these come together and impact what we're going to buy and when we're going to buy it. Uh, we also might have personal motivations, uh, maybe about, um, it might be related to image, it might be related to specific needs. So those can impact our decision-making uh, factor, as well as demographics. If we think about the kinds of things that we all buy at different stages of our lives, when we're at different ages, we have different, um, we're at different life cycle aspects of our lives, different income levels. So as we go through um, our lives, the, dem the factors that define us demographically can change and can also impact the kinds of things that we buy. And I think that no, no marketing class would be complete without a discussion of, of Maslow and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if we look at, at the graphic here, the first thing that we need, and really the main things that we all need are just food, clothing, and shelter. And so we can't really move on to making other purchase decisions until our needs for food, clothing, and shelter have been satisfied. Once those needs have been met, we can move on to other things where we want employment and personal security uh, and, and health and, and perhaps property. Once we, once we have those needs met, we can then move on to love and belonging. We wanna have friends. We wanna have uh, uh, you know, uh, relationships in our lives. We want a sense of belonging, a sense of connection. Uh, moving on to that, once we have those things, we can feel uh, more confident in ourselves. We have the feelings of respect, self-esteem, status recognition, and, and ultimately to self-actualization and the desire to be uh, the best that we can be. And as we move through all of these different uh, levels, we're going to be making different purchase decisions based on where we are in those different stages. So, so you know, our consumer decision-making process is, is quite complex, even if we're not fully aware of it. But as a marketer, you want to have a full understanding of your target market, of the kinds of messaging that's going to be um, appropriate at, at a particular time of life for your customers and that are going to address the specific needs that consumers have at the particular time that will influence how they make their decisions. So again, at this point that does uh, wrap up um, learning outcome one. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comment box. And as, as I have mentioned earlier, and as Mike mentioned earlier, we will address those at a later time. So moving on to the second learning outcome for unit four, we're going to explain the aspects of organizational markets and buying procedures and look at um, the characteristics of a B2B marketplace, a business to business market. Uh, we'll specifically be looking at how this varies and how it differs from a consumer decision-making process. We'll look at the stages of the B2B buying process. We'll look at different types of business to business buying situations and we're going to look specifically at a buying center and who its members are. And again, all of this looking at it from a different perspective from the, um, from the consumer decision-making process. So let's look at some of the differences between the, the business to business and business to consumer uh, markets. So first of all, a business to business market has fewer customers. There are going to be fewer players in the overall um, list of companies that, um, that will be buying from an organization. Also, there's a smaller number of customers that will impact company sales overall. Transactions will have larger do dollar amounts because companies are buying in, in volume and, and you know, at larger quantities than, than we would as consumers. It's also important to note that even if we're looking at a business to consumer uh, decision process where we might say, well, it might take a little bit of time to make that decision. The business to business decision making process is, is even longer. It's a very lengthy purchase process. Uh, there's a strong reliance on personal selling. I remember earlier we talked about personal selling as it relates to a business to consumer process, but in the business to business marketplace, personal selling is, is essential and there are very rigid product standards. So let's look at the stages 
in, in the business to business buying process. So uh, much like the consumer decision process, it's, it really starts with the need recognition, but at that point, that's where it really diverges into a completely different, uh, into a completely different uh, process. Uh, once there is um, a need recognition, the next step is to define and quantify the need. And this is where the product specifications uh, are, um, are identified, which can be much more complex uh, for, for an organization. Uh, a company will look at potential buyers, uh, excuse me, potential suppliers, which will then result in an RFP process, which is the re re request for proposal. So a company, when they're getting ready to make a purchase, will go to their different um, potential suppliers and ask them for a proposal on what it is the company is, is looking to buy. Uh, once that happens, the, the proposal will be analyzed, which is much like the consumer process where you're looking at your different choices, uh, but the supplier will be selected and the, and the um, criteria on which a company is making a decision will be will vary very different, very much from a consumer process. The next stage is to make the order, you know, specify the, the, the requirements, make the purchase, and then following that, um, evaluate the performance of, of the purchase, very often using metrics that will be quite complex. So let's look at the different kinds of buying situations that companies find themselves in. So if we start with a straight rebuy, it's when a company will buy the same products from the same supplier. And generally that will be a pretty um, quick process as long as there's no problems with, with the purchases in advance. Uh, sometimes a company will just have these as an automatic renewal for the purchase and maybe the company might not even go through the entire process uh, in advance, but just say, okay, you know, we want to make this, you know, we'll make this purchase every month. We don't need to go through the whole process each time. Uh, a new buy situation is when a company buys something for the very first time. So that's going to be quite complex because they'll be buying, they'll have to make sure that the specifications are clear. There might be um, a more in-depth um, evaluation of the different options that are available. Certainly there'll be more in, a more in-depth um, research into the companies, into the different suppliers that are available. So that's going to take generally quite a bit of time. A modified rebu rebuy is sort of a, a combination where a company will buy something they've purchased in the past, but they might make some changes. So they might make changes to product updates, they might change, make changes to delivery options as to when uh, maybe the frequency of a purchase or even the quantities that are purchased. So uh, these are the different buying situations that a company will find themselves in and depending upon which one will determine um, the complexity of the process. Okay, so let's look at a buying center. So within an organization, a buying center are all of the people that will be involved in making the purchase decisions. So uh, the, the center will include um, initiators and those are the people uh, who first identify a need within an organization. Uh, they may not necessarily be the users. So there are users within the organization uh, and they will be the ones who will actually use the product they might be the initiators, but not necessarily. The influencers also may or may not use the product, but can in, uh, in kind of integrate their experience into the buying process. Okay, the gatekeepers, these are very important people. They are controlling the flow of the suppliers who have access to the decision makers within the organization. The deciders, are the people who will ultimately make the purchase decision. Uh, and the, the position in an organization for a decider can really vary based on the cost and importance of the purchase itself. So uh, if we're talking about small inexpensive purchases, the decider might be at a lower level within an organization. Whereas if we're talking about uh, maybe higher quantities 
or uh, more expensive purchases, the decider will likely be someone who as who is um, maybe at the top levels of the organization. So all of these uh, players are, are what comprise the buying center. Again, this is a point where we would uh, pause for questions, but as you've reviewed and, and gone through the first two learning outcomes, feel free to put your comments into the comment, uh, comment box and we will be sure to get back to you with the answers to these questions. So moving on to the final learning outcome for unit four, we'll describe the distinctive characteristics of marketing services. And we'll look at the four eyes of marketing services and how a service business can benefit from things like referrals, reactivation, uh, demonstrating results in advance, as well as personal interaction. So it's important to recognize that services differ in many ways from, uh, from tangible goods. And the way that we can identify uh, the characteristics of services is to look at uh, the four eyes. And the first eye uh, refers to intangibility. And this is because a service cannot be touched. We can't hold it, uh, we can't see it. It's, it's much more uh, vague. So that's the first thing to, to consider when we're talking about how we're going to market a service. The next factor is the inconsistency because services, because they're not delivered by the same people each time, they, the, the um, quality can vary from provider to provider. Now, it's also important to recognize that even if a service is delivered by the same person each time, this still can be consistency, inconsistency rather. So for example, let's say if we talk about the service of getting a haircut and you go to the same hair cutter, barber, stylist each time, you may not get the same quality each time you go to that person for any number of reasons. Uh, it might be different time of the day, the person might be tired, they might not be feeling well, they might be having a bad day, they might be having a good day. So um, there's that factor of inconsistency that can um, be constant throughout um, the purchases of, of, that, of that service. Um, so inseparability. So it's important to recognize that the service and the provider cannot be separated. The person who is providing you with the service is also is, is, cannot be separated from that service itself. So they're, they're intertwined uh, inextricably. And finally, inventory. Services cannot be stored. So let's say if we look at um, a hotel uh, that provides us some tangible goods, but it's also providing us with the service of a room for the night. If, if a room is, um, is not occupied on any particular night, that cannot be stored. That is, it's lost, it's lost, it's lost um, profits, it's lost revenue. You can store a hotel room from one day to the next. If a store doesn't sell a dress on a particular day, they can save it for, to sell on another day, but, but services cannot be stored. If an airline, travels on a particular day and there's an empty seat that's lost revenue, they cannot store um, that, that seat. So these are kinds of some of the challenges associated with, with uh, marketing a service and understanding the factors that define a service uh, to us and to the providers. So how do you grow a service business? The first thing is you wanna have referrals. You wanna ask your your customers to refer you to other people, to other businesses. Uh, it's important to ask for those referrals because if you don't ask for them, cus your customers may not actually uh, take the time or effort to think about doing that. Uh, reactivation is when a company uses other aspects of their business to bring in new customers. So it's important to make sure that a company follows up on leads, sends personalized emails, try to determine the level of interest. Um, and these can all uh, open up, <clears throat> excuse me, open up new opportunities. Also, it's important to make sure that a company uh, leverages their websites in a way that can uh, be used for lead generation and provide valuable information. Ask for, uh, you know, uh, interest, ask for information from your customers so that you can provide content that will be uh, important and meaningful for them. 
Another way to grow a service business is to offer things for free. Uh, this way, a customer can potentially see what you have to offer, um, see the value that you bring, uh, and recognize that what they pay for can be even more significant. And very often, uh, companies or individuals are hesitant to give away free content. Say, well, if we, you know, we're giving away free, there's no reason for someone to actually pay for our services. Uh, when in fact, giving free content can generate interest. Uh, you're not giving away everything, you're giving away a taste of what you have to offer. And that could um, demonstrate the value that you have to offer uh, to, to customers and potential customers. Uh, special events have conferences, have workshops, have webinars. These can all highlight the services that you have to offer in a, in a real direct way. And this leads to the, to the final aspect of how to grow a uh, service business is by that personal interaction. You're able to uh, be face-to-face -face with, with people that, uh, or, or organizations that might be interested in what you have to offer. So those special events will you know, generate interest but make sure that you use those special events to, to have that personal interaction, to, to use the opportunity to build those, those important strategic relationships. And in service businesses, it's very important to, uh, to have those uh, relationships, to, to make sure that your customers know that you're there to provide them with a benefit, that you're giving them value. And that can only be achieved by that personal inter interaction. You can generate greater customer loyalty and, and also make sure that their interests are what's most important uh, to you in delivering those services. So, so having that you know, effective presentation is important. Again, you're highlighting um, your, your specific process, showing how you're different from the competition and differentiation is so important uh, and, and really ensuring that you're building that relationship in a way that can generate the trust that can lead to, to loyal customers going forward in the future. And with that, we conclude uh, unit four. Uh, as I had said earlier, it was a little bit um, briefer than some of the other units that we've covered, but really you know, content rich in terms of, of business to business and, uh, and, and how we uh, can market services. So again, um, I thank you for joining me. And as always, again, uh, put your questions in the comment box and I will be getting back to you as soon as possible. And I look forward to seeing you in the review for future units. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And we will, uh, we will be uh, also pre-recorded next week or we won't be, but it won't matter because I'm just putting this in to remind myself that I'm going to put a thing in where I say stuff later, but it won't matter because you're just going to be in there looking like I'm talking and I'm just going to have my face going and we'll see you this time. And this is about the amount of time it'll take. And I'll go, so just thank you again, everyone for joining us. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Salzer for walking us through this and, uh, uh, check out the video next week. Thank you. Thank you.